Hello, students. This is your um, GET 272 online class. I hope you are all doing well. I know these are difficult times for all of us, and um, hopefully everything will get back to normal. I urge you to continue to keep safe, and by God's grace, we'll all get over this current pandemic that is facing us. As you are aware, the lockdown has forced a closure of the university, which has interrupted um, our classes for the 2019-2020 uh, rain semester. And the university has given directive to us that we should complete our classes online. I have uh, examined different uh, avenues that I could explore to reach out to you so we can conclude the semester. And I've been looking at all the opportunities available. I have uh, chosen this particular platform to reach out to you. So I have decided to make videos of the remaining lectures and send them over to you. I hope you get hold of these lectures and I will also suggest avenues by which you can reach back to me in case you have any question concerning the lectures. Hopefully we should be able to round up the remaining topics for the semester. As at the last time we interacted, we're discussing imperfection in solids. And by our schedule, we'll still have uh, two more topics to cover. These are the mechanical properties of engineering materials and uh, an introduction to composite materials. So I will start today's lecture by completing from where we stopped. I'll try to complete lecture five, which is imperfection in solids. So I cannot remember vividly where we stopped, so I will take it from the beginning. That is the lecture five. I will rush through from the beginning and hopefully I can conclude this particular lecture in this video. So the, the lecture five is titled Imperfection in Solids. I know I, I have introduced this particular uh, lecture before now, but I will still take my time to take you through the introduction of this lecture. If you recall, I mentioned to you that there is no such thing as a perfect material. So imperfection is part and parcel of materials. What is important is how this imperfection can be of positive impact on the materials. So you will remember that I mentioned to you that the properties of materials are generally influenced by the imperfections that are present in them. So it is important for us to understand this imperfection that exists in this material so it can allow us to uh, manipulate the properties of this material so that we can have uh, multiple applications for these materials. So therefore, it is important that we study these imperfections and understand the role that they will play in the properties of these materials. So for a start, you already have the understanding that crystalline materials are not as perfect as they seem. You may recall that we have uh, understood the concept of crystalline materials as materials that are having an orderly structure. Now, this orderliness does not translate to perfections. There are ideal solids that can alter that orderly arrangement that forms defects in them. Now, this defect is what we regard to as imperfections. And this defect means that the regularity that you have in crystalline will no longer be available. So therefore, it creates some form of irregularity in crystals. And these irregularities that you have in crystalline materials is what we term as the defect. 
So we need to understand this defect in order to understand their role in the property of the material. So this defect in solids that we're talking about can be classified according to their geometry. And uh, this is where we are going to pick it out from. So what we want to look at in this particular lecture is to understand the defect that arises in solids. And we should understand the types of these defects, how they are varied and how much we can control these defects so as we can have absolute control over what the property of the material should be. Also, we, we need to understand how this defect will affect the properties of the materials. And then lastly, you should be able to have an understanding of the desirability of these defects, whether they have positive impact or negative impact on the properties of the materials. So like I said earlier, the defects are classified based on their dimension. So as a result, we have a point defect, which is a zero dimensional defect. This will include vacancies, interstitial atoms, and substitutional atoms. The other is a one-dimensional, which is a line defect, which usually comes as a result of a mistake in the stacking planes of an atom. So we're going to discuss this in, in detail. And um, basically, when you hear of a line defect, what comes to mind is the dislocation. I will explain to you later how this impacts on the property of materials. The third is a two-dimensional defect, which is referred to as a planar or an area defect. These are the surface and the grain boundaries. And lastly, we have a three-dimensional defect, which will result from the creation of an entirely new phase in, in, in the structure. So these are the, the, the type of defect that we have based on the dimensions that they present. So why why do we really need to care about this defect what is what is so important about this defect and why is it necessary to understand uh this defect like i said earlier the properties of the materials are altered by the change in the structure you know this from the very beginning of this uh particular uh class so these these properties that we want to alter requires that we make alteration to the structure of the material. So one way to alter the structure is by introduction of defect or impurity as you as you may whichever way you want to call it. So this will this will ultimately lead to an alteration of the property of the material because you understand very well that materials based on the structures we Will, will present to you specific properties and those properties will allow you to determine the kind of processing you want to put the materials through so that you can find a suitable engineering application for that material. So in this case, we have an original structure we, and uh, we want to make, want to have a certain desired property that will suit certain applications. So there is the need for us to change that structure. So the, 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 the presence of impurities can help achieve this. So an example is, for instance, if you want to play around with mechanical property of a material, you can do so by introduction of impurity, which will lead to the production of metallic alloys. And this will have a, a, a great influence on the, on, the, on the mechanical properties like improving strength, improving ductility, and all what have you. You can also have same with electrical properties where you can have influence on the metal conductivity or doping in the case of semiconductors in order for you to be able to control conductivity as well. Also for optical properties, you can have defects by, by, by doping where it allows you to be able to make changes to the wavelength of light that is being absorbed or emitted by the materials. All of this imperfection can allow you to change the property of the materials. And of course, there are so many other examples that you can, you can, you can look at when you, when you want to talk about the effect of uh, defect on the properties of our materials. So we, let, let's start with the first type of defect, which is the point defect. So, so the point defect is, is the one dimensional 
defects that uh, we, we I mentioned for the first type, which is usually either coming in, in form of a vacancy or in, in terms of an interstitial atom and all what have you. So the first one is, is, is vacancy. So like, as the name implies, you are, you are looking at a situation whereby there is, there is, there is a vacant site there is a vacant site on, on the on the on the structure on the crystalline on the crystalline structure so you can see from this slide you can see an orderly arrangement of uh, the atoms and you can see that the absence of an atom on the third row has shown a form of distortion to the planes to the arrangements of the plane so this this missing atom creates what is called a vacancy so you see something like a missing atom there so this missing atom will create vacancy and of course it will affect the entire structure of an atom now this this vacancy of course will have impact on the property of the atom so if you remember we have looked at this in the class and we have tried to understand the energy that is required to create this vacancy because the essence of understanding this vacancy is that one should be able to alter the structure by creating this vacancy so if you create this vacancy you are able to alter the structure so what do you need to be able to create this vacancy which is the energy required to create this vacancy so the equation presented on this slide is the is what is the is the is the number of vacancies that you can create vis a vis the input parameter that you have. So based on the activation energy that is required to remove an atom from the structure, you can always calculate the number of vacancies that you want to create based on the number of lattice sites that you have. So I think we have done this in class and we have looked at some example. So I will refer you to the textbook Callista. Remember I told you that uh, this the textbook is very important for this course. So if you go to Proven, if you go to example problem 5.1 on, on page 157, you will see, no, sorry, on page 129, you will see a problem there on number of vacancy for, uh, computation at a specified temperature. So there's an example there. I want you to check that example for you to have a good understanding of a uh, uh, vacancy. Okay. So the next is uh, interstitial. The next is interstitial. So uh, the first is the self interstitial. So in this case, this is a situation where you have an extra atom trying to force itself to sit in between, uh, in between, in between the, the the lattice sites. So you have an extra atom, just opposite of what we discussed earlier with vacancy. So you have an extra atom trying to force itself in between the last side so this will also cause a, this will also cause a distortion on the structure and of course once there's a distortion there is a change of structure and this change of structure of course will lead to a change of uh, uh, uh property so what you see here as uh, a self-interstitial atom meaning that you have the same type of atom trying to force itself into a uh, into a lattice site so there's no vacant space but you have to find a way of forcing an extra atom with the same type as the atoms in the structure to, to, to stay in there. So you form that the kind of distortion that you have on this slide. So here what it means is that there's also an energy requirement for this to happen. So you, you have a situation where um, you, you want to put in an extra atom. So you can also calculate the number of um, um, self-interstitial site that you can create if you know the activation energy to impose an atom on this structure i think we have also dealt with this particular equation in class you can refer to Callista for the examples in there and some other exercise so what you also notice on this slide is that there is a question there that says that self-interstitials are usually not as highly probable as vacancy so you you should you should also look at this question and understand why this is the case so you see it's not so easy for you to impose an extra atom into a space that is tight compared to removing um an atom to create a vacant site so if you understand that you will see that typically the interstitial sites are much smaller than lattice atoms so 
So, so the self-interstitial will require a significantly large amount of energy in order for you to be able to create a self-interstitial. So you have that the, the activation energy for self-interstitial is, is far, far greater than the activation energy to create a vacancy. So now we, we, are, we have understood the concept of vacancy and uh, in, in interstitial atoms. So the question now is that what happens when you have uh, these uh, interstitial atoms? So it's like you are now having impurity. So the defect in this case is resulting from you putting an impurity into a particular uh, a structure. So if you have a small impurity, we just consider it as a point defect. So, but sometimes when this impurity becomes so large, we now begin to consider it as a solution. So in this case, because we are dealing with solid structures, so we can, we can term it as a solid solution. So you have an example in, in, in metallic alloys, for instance. So, you know, that's a typical example of a solid uh, solution. So what we understand is, what you need to understand is that if you take pure metals that are consisting of uh, only just one type of atom, you, you will see that this is this is really not possible for you to have. So there is always going to be some form of foreign atoms that will be present. Now this foreign atom will exist in the crystalline as a point defect if they are very small, and if they become very substantial, you can form a solid solution. So you will see that it is difficult for you to have a refined metal to have an impurity to to have impurity in excess of say for instance 9.9 percent. So to have a purity of 9.9. So there's, there's always going to be some form of impurity in the metal. So this, this impurity usually is not so bad because what they can do is that they can have impact on, the specific, on some specific uh, characteristics of the material. So it is important that we understand it. So the addition of impurity atoms to a metal will result in the formation of a solid solution. And this solid solution, of course, will have some enhanced property or for the material and this enhanced property can serve as advantage for uh, deriving applications for this material. So in the formation of a solid solution, we understand that you have a distribution of impurity. I, just the way you have it in a liquid solution, in, in this case, it's a crystalline structure. So you have a host material and you have the impurity therein. So just like you have it in a, in a liquid solution, there's a solvent, there is a solute. So in the case of a solid solution, you have same. So in this case, for a solvent, the element or the compound that is most abundant is your host atom. And then the one that is there in minor quantity, which obviously is your impurity atoms, will now form your solute. And the combination of these two in an homogeneous distribution will give you a solid solution. So the, 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 there are two, if you, if you, try, to, if you try to form a, a point defect in an alloy, for instance, according to this slide, you will see that um, there are two outcomes if you add an impurity B to a host A. So if you look at those two, um, if you look at those two structures, so you have example on this slide is copper in nickel and uh, copper in iron. So you will see that for copper in nickel, you have a substitutional alloy. So you have the impurity and this host in such a way that um, it's more of a substitution. You are removing, you are removing an atom of one and replacing with the other, just like the word the name substitution imply. So if you compare that with an interstitial alloy, for instance, like you have it in carbon in iron, so you will see that the impurity atoms are just trying to occupy. Uh, space between the lattice sites. So that's an interstitial alloy. So if you have a solid solution of B in A plus particles of a new phase, usually greater than B, you can form a second phase and that second phase will have a different composition and ultimately will give you uh, a different structure. So there are, there, are, there are certain conditions that will allow you to be able to create um, a new, a solid solution. So, so that condition is what we refer to as the solubility for solid solution. So it is not all combinations of, uh, of, of, of atoms that can give you a solid solution. So solubility for substitutional atom is different from that of an interstitial atom. So 
the first one, which is for a substitutional atom, will be dependent on four factors. So these factors is what I will explain now. I know I've explained this before, but I will still explain again. So the first one is the atomic size factor. So here, the, which is very important, is that the atomic radii for the two for, for, for the two atoms that you are mixing together should have a, a, a radii difference that is less than 15%. So what it means is that they should have comparable atomic sizes so that you know you want to you want to remove one atom and replace with the other. So the, the host and the and the impurity should have uh, nearly equal uh, atomic uh, atomic size. And in that case, the, the factor is that the difference should be less than 15%. Secondly, the crystal structure. So for you to be able to make a solid uh, substitutional uh, solution, the, the, the host atom and the impurity atom should have a similar crystal structure. They should be of the same crystal structure. So what I mean here is that if the host atom is an FCC, is, is an FCC, is a face-centered crystal structured, then the, the, the impurity should, too should be a face-centered uh, cubic structure. So that's what I mean. So they must have the same um, crystal structure. So, thirdly, the too large electronegativity difference will lead to intermetallic compounds rather than forming a solution. So you want them to have very close um, electronegativity in order for you to be able to form a solid solution. And then lastly, they should have same valency also. So these factors, once they are complete, then it means if you have these factors all positive, then it means that you can form a solid solution from the combination of the two atoms. So I give example here. So we have a cesium germanium alloy. So let us let us test and see if these two can form a solid solution or not. So for the first one, which is the um, which is the atomic size. So you see that the radius the radius are, are they are they are comparable. The radius for 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 the radius is um 0 0.17 nanometer and uh, 0 0.122 nanometer. So you can see that the percentage difference in the radius is 4%, which is far far below the 15% that I talked about. So it means that the, the atomic sizes are, are they are comparable. You see that both of them have a diamond structure, so that's also favorable. Their electronegativities are 2.0 uh, uh, and 1.90 uh, and 2.01, which is also favorable. And then they, are, they both have valency of uh, 4. So in this case, what it means is that um, they, they can form a solid solution over a wide composition range simply because all four conditions are favorable. So in fact, solid solution forms over the entire composition at high temperature. So in, 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 in advanced courses on alloy, you will understand this better. So, but for now you can see that once all factors are met, you can conclude that um, they can form a, a, a solid solution. Another example is the copper silver alloy. So the copper silver alloy, if we test for all the, uh, all the uh, condition, all the factors that we talked about, you will see that um, copper has a radius of 0.128 nanometer, while silver has a radius of 0.144 nanometer. So if you look at this, you see that uh, the difference in uh, the radius, uh, atomic radius is about 9.4%, uh, which is less than 15%, so that's favorable. So copper and silver both have the FCC crystal structure, so having the same crystal structure means that that factor is also favorable. If you look at the electronegativities, you see that the electronegativity for copper is 1.9, that of nickel is 1.80, which is also favorable according to the, the percentage difference. Now, lastly, if you look at their valency, copper has a valency of plus two, silver has a valency of plus one, so they have different uh, valency. So this is not favorable. So what it means is that of all the four factors that you have tested, only three are favorable. So outrightly, you cannot say that you cannot form a solid solution from this. But what it means is that you can form a limited solid solution. So it means that silver and copper, so, so it means that you should expect that silver and copper will have limited solubility. So it means that for very, very limited conditions, you can have uh, a solid solution. Otherwise, you will not be able to get a, a solid solution. So in higher, in higher classes, maybe for those of you that are mechanical engineering, those of you materials, when you start studying phase diagrams and solubility for, for, for metals, you will understand the, the range of solubility for one metal in the other. So, so this, this explains that. So 
The second um, solid solution is the interstitial uh, solution. So remember the first one I just finished explaining with example is uh, substitutional. So for interstitial, you, you need a large difference in atomic radius because you know you are looking at a situation whereby you want the impurity atoms to go and occupy um, some sites some sites in between to go and occupy spaces in between the atomic sites. So in this case, you need you need a large atomic uh, difference in atomic radii. So for most metals that have close pack with relatively uh, atomic packing fractions, you can have this kind of uh, situation. So if you take example, for instance, uh, carbon in iron, you see that the the atomic radius for carbon is 0.071 nanometer, that of uh, ion is 0.12. So you can see a large difference in the atomic size. So what it means is that be the carbon atom having very small atomic size compared to the uh, ion means that it can sit in between the lattice site and form uh, interstitial solid solution. So, so that is all for uh, uh, for point defect. That is the zero dimensional defect. So we now go to the, we now go to the linear, the linear defect. So, which is the uh, uh, the, the the one-dimensional defect. So, once you once you once you talk about the linear defect, what comes to mind? What comes to mind is uh, the uh, what comes to mind is the uh, dislocation. So, what comes to mind is dislocation. So, the 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 linear the linear defect is one that is explained by either an edge dislocation or a screw dislocation. So we are we are just going to try to understand what a line defect is, and then we proceed. So once you have um, a situation where there is a defect around which some of the atoms are misaligned. So if you look at the if you look at the the structure on on the on the slide, you will see that there is there is a misalignment. In one of the in one of the lines, so like you have a missing one of the one of the lines is not complete. There is a missing part, so that will cause some form of distortion. So you must have understood even from the point defect that what is the effect of the impurity is actually to cause a distortion in the original st uh, structure. So you see, once there is a missing plane or there is a misalignment in the planes, you will have a distorted structure. So in this case, if the missing um, entity is a one and is, is, is in one dimension then you have a line defect and this kind of line defect is what is called a dislocation now this dislocation is the driving force for for ductility so what it means is that you see this distortion can move so you see that missing plane can move so if you see for instance if you look at the structure you will see that on the vertical there are there are six atoms but if you get to the to the fourth column you see it you see a three atoms so you see that three column is an incomplete plane so you see that incomplete plane can move and it's it and is, as it is moving you can term it as a dislocation movement now this dislocation movement is what allows for ductility of a material of a metal so you see this line defect is a driving it is driving force for 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 ductility so what it means is that if you want to deform a material you must be a metal specifically you must be able to drive movement of the dislocation so the ability for the dislocation to move will allow the met, met, met metal to be able to deform so this is very important so this is an example of a of an edge dislocation so you, you when you have um when you have a dislocation such that there is a there is a missing plane you have a, or a mismatch there you have a hedge dislocation so the second is a screw dislocation which is caused by a shift in one of the atomic distance so something like a shift like a shear deformation as you can see from from that from that from that uh, this figure you can see on this slide so there is a shift so there's a shift there that shift there is going to cause for you a screw dislocation you can even have a situation where you have both edge and screw dislocation on the same material once you have this condition you call it a mix dislocation so these both both the edge dislocation and screw dislocation they are typical examples of a line defect they are they are very important in understanding the formation of metallic material and therefore you will now see 
that this defect that we are talking about has a direct influence on the property of the metal, in this case, ductility or deformation as the case may be. So this, the, the, the third is the planar defect. So the third is the planar defect. So in, in terms of the planar defect, we have, we have it in different types. We have the surface and interface. We have the grain boundaries. We have the twins and we have stacking faults. So I will explain all of this for you to understand the concept of a planar defect. So the first of them, which is the external surface. So what happens, how does this become a defect? It becomes a defect because there is going to be some kind of mismatch in what you have on the surface compared to what you have in the body of the structure. So for external surface, for instance, you have surface atoms that are not bounded to the maximum number of nearest neighbor. So for instance, if you take two atoms, for instance, one at the internal structure and one on the surface, you will realize that the atom within the structure is bounded fully by the surrounding atoms, that is the neighboring atoms. But if you take an atom on the surface, for instance, you will see that it is bounded on one side by the, by the atoms below, and it is not bounded on the outside. So what it means is that the surface atom has missing bonds. That is the implication. The surface atom has missing bonds. So what it means is the surface, all the atoms on that surface will now create a, 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 will now create a two dimensional structure that is having a, a property that is different from what you have from the internal atom. So what you now have is that there is a higher energy state than the atoms at the interior position. So what it means is the surface atom are highly energized. So what it means is they can have, they have the possibility to attract um, things from the outside into the structure. So this will imply that you can have them impact on the structure based on whatever kind of interaction they decide to have with the um, with the outside uh, entity, maybe in terms of interacting with another structure or what have you. So this kind of uh, surface property is what is we refer to as the external surface. So the, the next is the grain boundary. The next is the grain boundary. So, so for the grain boundary, you are having um, a 2D defect that separates two small grains. So how do we define how do we define a grain? So what you what you see is that a grain, based on our understanding of what a crystal is, we we know that it's it's a regular arrangement of atoms. So therefore, it means that arrangement comes in a particular pattern. So if you have um, a situation whereby, say for instance, two grains are combined together to form a single structure. Now, it is possible for you to combine those two structures such that the arrangements are aligned. So it's, what it means is that one becomes a continuation of the other, or you have a combination in whereby they are not aligned. So for instance, if you look at the orientation of the, of the atoms in one, and it doesn't align with the other, you may have a misfit. And this misfit will now form what is called a grain boundary. So for instance, if you take two surfaces, I have two surfaces on this slide as an example. If you take two surfaces and such that the two surfaces are, have, are having atoms aligned in the same orientation. So if you put them together, you form a perfect aligned structure. So in that case, you don't form a grain boundary. So it means there is no boundary that shows the beginning of one grain and termination of the other. But if you take two, two grains with different surfaces such that the, the, the orientation of the of the atoms are the orientation of the atoms and they are not aligned and you combine them together you will have a misfit in the arrangement in the orientation of the atom so that misfit will now create like a boundary for you it will create a boundary and then you see that boundary now becomes very very important in understanding certain properties so I quickly give you an example so what it means is if you have a boundary that boundary can serve as can serve so many function in the structure. So a typical example is if I if you go back to what I said earlier on dislocation movement that if you're able to control dislocation movement, you're able to control deformation, which is ductility. So what it means is that sometimes when you want to straighten a metal, 
this grain boundary can serve as can serve as a point of preventing the movement of uh, dislocation. So what it means is, once dislocations are moving, when they get to a grain boundary, that becomes an obstruction for their movement. So in that case, it it, it prevents movement of dislocation, and as a result, you are able to strengthen the material because you are preventing move, uh, dislocation movement, which will hinder the formation. Hence. It will strengthen the material. So this is a typical example of the importance of grain boundaries. Once you want to understand the effect of this particular defect on the property of a crystalline material. So this boundary that is separating two grains or crystals that are having different crystal uh, crystallographic orientation in polycrystalline material is what we call a grain boundary. So, but if you have if you are if you are if you are combining two two grains together and your the orientation is the same, if you combine them together, you just form a perfectly aligned structure, and of course you don't have any grain boundary. So the, the third is a twin boundary. So for a twin boundary, you have a special misorientation. It, this is this is similar to the grain boundary, except that in this case you have a specific mirror lattice mm -hmm. symmetry. So the special misorientation here is that one side of the boundary is the mirror image of the other side of the boundary. So it's, it's similar to the grain boundary, except now is that you have one side being an, an era, mirror, um, and sorry, you have one side of the of the grain being an uh, a mirror a mirror image of the of the other. So that is the case. So you can have two ways of having this, uh, these twin boundaries. So same way, you see this twin boundary will also perform similar function as, as the grain boundary. So you can see they are the same. So, and if you want to achieve this twin boundary, you can have it mechanically or by heating. So if you, if you, can, you can have a mechanical twin, if you, if, you, if you do by application of shear forces, and you can have an aligning twin, if you do that, if you try to do that, if you try to achieve that by uh, heat treatment of the metal so whichever so this is also very important as it affects the property that is also important as it affect as it affect the property of the material so what are the effect of this grain boundary very important so the grain boundary can change mechanical properties of the material so what it means is that the boundaries can serve as good places for fracture to occur also they can hinder the movement of dislocation so whichever so what it means is for instance if you if you want to if you want to if you want to maybe if you want to obstruct fracture growth you can you can achieve this by introduction of green boundaries and um, if you want to hinder dislocation so that you strengthen the material you can also introduce more green boundaries and all what have you so with, with for electrical properties you can have um a good place to scatter electrons or to inhibit their movement, depending on the, 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 the grain boundaries that you have there in. So what it means is that if, if, you have, if you have a grain boundary, if you have so many grain boundaries, what it means is that it will hinder their movement, it will hinder the scattering of the electrons, which will definitely have an impact on the electrical property of the material. And if you want to allow for free movement and easy scattering of the electron, you want to avoid this um, grain boundary. So this is, these are very, very important uh, uh, impact of grain boundaries on properties of material. So the grain boundaries can also serve as site for atomic diffusion. So diffusing atom will move easily in the boundaries, within the boundaries. Of course, they cannot cross the boundary. So if you want them to, if you want them to move far and wide, you have to make sure that these boundaries are missing. And if you want to contain them, you have to introduce these boundaries to contain them. So there are so many there are so many other examples if you read the textbook i, I expect that you get more so the last of them is stacking faults the last is stacking faults so so anytime if you have um if you have combination of uh of of, of atoms you can see this example you can have this uh you can have this arrangement in form of stacks you can have it in some form of stacks so if you if you look at these slides you see stacking in form of A, B, C. So what it means is stack A is having similar atom arrangements, stack B is also similar atoms, stack C is similar atoms. So if you continue, if you if you continue to repeat these stacks, you will form you form a unique structure with um, a regular arrangement that will repeat itself periodically. 
So anytime the stacking sequence of an atom makes a difference or there's an error in the stacking of an atom, it can change the properties of a material. So what it means is that if you have an original atom of say, the stack is defined such that you have ABC, 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 ABC continuously, that's a unique arrangement and that gives you a unique uh, property. So for some reason, if you change the stack, so say for instance, like what you have on this slide, you have ABC, then you have ABA, you get it? Then you have ABA, then you have CBA, something like that. So there's a change in the sequence of this stack. Once you do that, you have what is called a stacking fault. So usually what this stacking fault does is that it completely changes the crystal structure of the, of the material. So for example, the stacking faults can convert FCC crystal structure to HCP. So you have a face-centered QP structure completely becoming an hexagonal closed pack. So you can see this is this is this is completely changing the structure. And you you understood before now that once you have a complete change in structure, it means that you are going to have a change in property. So this is the this is the intention. The intention is for us to be able to to manipulate properties. Uh, as a result of the change in the structure. So if we're able to change the structure, it means we can have a different property. So we can have a different application for the material compared to our originally intended application based on the initial structure. So this is what stacking for is all about. So, there, there, we have, so there's also possibility of imperfections in polymer. So all two have been discussing imperfection in, sol, in, in, in metallic solids. So in polymer also, you can have imperfection similar to what you have in metals and ceramics. You can have interstitial atoms, you can have vacancies, and then you can have surface, surface defects also. You know, there are, there are, that if you remember our lecture on polymer, we talked about chain ends. So you can look at imperfections there since they are different than the repeating unit. So remember, there's going to be a chain end. So the repeating unit will terminate somewhere. So where that, where that termination exists, you can have a property similar to the surface defect that you have with uh, metals and ceramic uh, material. So you can have that. And then you can also have a situation of um, a mismatch, something like a stacking fault there. If you have um, an amorphous, if you have an amorphous polymer, um, blended together with um, with a crystalline polymer, so you can have something similar to a stacking fault there. So you see that mismatch can also form some kind of a defect. And if you have copolymer, if you have copolymer, copolymer. So just the way we we, we talked about uh, grains, you can have a copolymer in this case. So if you have a copolymer and the the copolymer is such that there is no there is a there is no they don't blend well or there is a form of boundary or an interface between the polymers. This can form a form of defects in the polymer. And of course, these defects can have you change uh, the properties of the polymer. So I, I like us to keep this deformation of the material here. I have deliberately left the first part, which is the formation of a brand new phase, which is the three-dimensional defect. So uh, we, I, I want to make this as brief as possible. And um, I, I hope that you have understood most of the things that I said. We have done some in class. I've also explained some new concepts uh, in this video. So some of the concepts that I want you to remember is a point defect, which is the vacancy, the self-interstitial and impurity, and the formation of a solid solution. You remember we talked about an interstitial solid solution, and we talked about a substitutional solid solution the formation of alloy, their solubilities, and you must understand the factors that determines the formation of an interstitial solid solution or a substitutional uh, solid solution. We also looked at um, um, line defect, which is the dislocation. So we have looked at edge and screw dislocation and I've explained to you some of the effect of a uh, line dislocation as it affects the property of a material. We have looked at grain boundary, which is the the surface, the interface, the twin, and uh, the, the stacking fault. And we have understood how these grain boundaries can affect the properties of a material, ranging from mechanical properties to electrical properties to optical properties. So you will understand that these imperfections we are talking about, they are very important in determining the, the properties of a material. They are very key. Because if you, if you just take a pure material, you just have a unique property and then you can find an application for it. So what it means is that you cannot alter 
the property. So you cannot change, you cannot find variable applications for them if you cannot alter the structure. So the best way to alter the structure is for you to be able to introduce impurity into them or you are able to cause a defect in them. And then of course, being impure, be imperfect now turn out to be uh, something very, very uh, important in determining the property of a material and at the same time, uh, giving uh, application or variable and multiple applications to this material. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I will stop this video for today. I, I encourage you to, to, to read up all other op or topics that we have discussed in class together with this that I'm presenting. So, this will mark the end of this particular lecture. I hope that uh, I've been able to pa pass in some message across to you that will be beneficial for your learning of this course. So I know very well that these are difficult, difficult times for all of us, and um, we have to we have to continue. We cannot just continue to stay idle doing nothing. So we have to we have to continue learning, and I I, I I encourage all of you to continue to learn, to continue to to study your 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 materials, and you can reach out to me. Uh, if you go, I, I gave you some contacts in the class where you can reach me. You can reach me via email. You can reach me via phone, via my telephone. You can reach me via WhatsApp. So I, I will encourage you to reach me via WhatsApp if you have any question concerning this lecture. And I'll be very happy to respond to any of your questions. So I am glad we already have an assessment done during the mid term. So there will be no need to be talking about uh, a continuous assessment right now. So we will just focus on completing the topics that we have left outstanding. So I, I hope you, you benefit from this video. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, if you have any challenges, if you want me, if there is anything you want me to do that will aid in your understanding of this course, please feel free to talk to me. And as you are very much aware, I'm going to be available to assist you in any way that will be beneficial to you. So gentlemen and ladies, the, the coronavirus pandemic is here. It has come to stay with us. There is nothing we can do while those concerned are doing their best to, to, to find some way to get it eradicated. We should continue to keep safe. Please keep safe and uh, try to follow all the protocols, all the preventive measures as uh, outlined by the health uh, personnel, the NDDC. And uh, hopefully we will not have a share in all of this pandemic, God's willing. I wish you the very best. So I will work on the other topics and I will get them through to you as soon as they are ready. I wish you all the very best. Bye-bye.